So this is our 1045. Do you want to go into it, Ms. O'Bannon? You have any need for a break? Everybody ready to go? I think we're okay this time. We didn't go quite so long. Okay. So um, this is a update on the uh, comprehensive plan. We've got uh, Rosemary Deemer, Joe Emerson, Ben Blankenship, and Terrell Hughes, who have components to uh, what is a pretty significant effort going forward. So I'm not going to steal anyone's uh, thunder. I'm just going to turn it over to Rosemary. Good morning. On behalf of the planning department, I'm here to provide a status update on the updating process to the 2026 comprehensive plan. Um, as you'll recall, we kicked off our efforts last year at the retreat, and you heard Mr. Emerson and our lead consultant discuss the scope of the project, the timeline, and various deliverables. At that time, you provided recommendations to us on engaging the public in the planning process. This image you may be familiar with, um, it provides a timeline for the project, which is broken down into five phases. Phase one was devoted to initiating the project, which included developing a brand, logo, and tagline, as well as creating a website. This phase was completed in May of 2021. We're currently in phase two, analyzing trends and conditions. Staff and the consultants are finalizing several reports that provide snapshots of the county in terms of sociodemographic information, recreation and parks, and transportation. Upon completion, they'll be provided to you and the planning commission for feedback. These assessments provide the basis of where the county is today and where we're heading based on current trends and future planning influences. Phase two also included the launching of our website and two surveys and will include our first community engagement event. The third phase, evaluating growth alternatives, will provide an opportunity to simulate different land use and development choices and determine how those choices might impact community character, transportation systems, and the county's fiscal health. There will be another opportunity to engage with the public during this part of the project. In phase four, the project team will take all the outcomes of the first three phases and develop a complete draft comprehensive plan for public review. The final phase will entail adoption of the plan following public hearings before the Planning Commission and Board of Supervisors. The consultants will also provide an updated design guidelines manual, a public facilities and utilities manual, a fiscal model, and a list of potential zoning and subdivision amendments necessary to implement the plan. It is anticipated that the process will be completed in late spring 2024. As you know, we're quickly approaching the planning horizon of the 2026 plan. And as a plan ages, it's not unusual to find instances where approved rezonings begin to differ from the original land use recommendations. This image identifies the number of approved rezoning cases per year since the adoption of the 2026 plan and whether they were consistent with the plan. This slide depicts the type of inconsistencies that have been occurring. As you can see, there's been a number of requests that were designated office, but were ultimately rezoned to some other land use category. These inconsistencies, along with a shift away from office development and an increase in redevelopment, both infill and urbanization, are driving the need to reevaluate our future land use designations. In addition to analyzing land use trends, the staff and the consultants have been working to identify the county's socio-demographic composition. Following the release of general census data, staff began to draft a socio-demographic report. The following slides will provide some basic information on population, housing units, and household income in the county. Staff anticipates updating this report once additional census data is published as part of the American Community Survey. Before you is some general population information. As you can see between 2010 and 2020, the county region and state continued to gain population, but not at the same rates experienced between 1990 and 2000 and 2000 and 2010. Our current population of 334,389 residents represents an increase of 27,454 people or a 9% increase over 2010. 
between 2000 and 2019, there was an increase in the number of both single family and multifamily housing units. Henrico added nearly 7,700 units in the last decade, compared to 17,400 in the previous 10 year period. Between 2000 and 2019, single family homes represented nearly 65% of the housing stock, while multifamily units made up the remaining 35. Moving on to income, this chart shows the median household income in Henrico has remained steady at approximately $70,000 a year for the last 10 years. This follows a decline in inflation adjusted income between 2000 and 2010. Both Virginia and the Richmond metro area have also experienced low growth in median household income in the last 10 years. Stagnant wages since 2000, along with the recession of 2007, are two of the reasons behind this national trend. In addition to sociodemographic information, staff and consultants are working on analyzing trends and conditions for other topical areas. One new document is an existing conditions report of our recreation and parks facilities. This document identifies the county's various parks and facilities and provides an inventory of amenities at each. Numerous sites were assessed to identify conditions which have a direct effect on the quality of programming and user experiences. Once complete, we'll share this report with the Board and Planning Commission and post it to our website. Another focus of the study is the county's transportation network. Our subconsultants are finalizing a report that will include summaries of the road network, transit, rail, and air service. It will also contain information on those segments of roads that are at or over capacity. New to the analysis is a summary of crashes, including those involving pedestrians and bicycles. In a, the information we've been gathering will be used as background to the development of the plan's transportation chapter, as well as the major thoroughfare plan map. You may have seen transportation plans that include Henrico County circulated by various regional entities. Those plans contain suggested improvements identified by outside organizations. As is the case now, the completed major thoroughfare plan and associated mapping will represent the official recommendations for the county's transportation network. Additionally, the Department of Public Works has been working to develop a draft bike network plan to be included as part of the transportation chapter. We anticipate sharing that draft as part of the upcoming community engagement event. And I believe Mr. Hughes will have more information on that following my presentation. Earlier, I mentioned the development of a project website. It went live in August of 2021, corresponding with the launch of our community survey. The survey officially commenced in September and 5,000 households were randomly selected, 1,000 per magisterial district, and sent an invitation to participate. Upon completion, respondents were asked to participate in a separate recreation and park survey. Because we knew not everyone who answered a community survey would complete one for recreation and parks, we supplied VCU's survey evaluation and research laboratory with an additional 4,000 mailing addresses which was 8,000, uh, I'm sorry, 800 per magisterial district. All recipients were directed to a website dedicated to the recreation and park survey. At the close of the survey window, we had 1,148 completed community surveys and 778 recreation and park surveys. And we anticipate a detailed report on both surveys by the end of this month. I'm sorry, so you sent out 5,000, how many came back? 1,148. <laughs> That's it's a probably good percentage. It's twenty five point eight percent. Pretty good, but <laughs> no, usually it's like eight or ten percent. So that's actually very good. But okay, thank you. The responses to the survey will assist in identifying the core values of our citizens and critical issues that require planning solutions. We'll use them to help develop the new plan's future vision goals and objectives. Upon receipt of the survey results and the finalized background reports, the department will schedule work sessions with the board and planning commission to present the findings. We'll then make them available on the project website. Using information gathered from the surveys, we'll create the format and presentation materials for our first public engagement event. 
with an intent to involve residents and stakeholders earlier in the process, we have scheduled a hybrid community meeting for March 23rd. Those wishing to participate in person can join us in the boardroom, while a virtual option will be provided for those who'd like to participate remotely. Using online polling with real-time results, we hope to receive feedback on the community's values and opinions about planning priorities. Presentation materials and polling exercise will be posted to the project website for several weeks following to provide those unable to attend the March 23rd event with an opportunity to participate. And that concludes my presentation. As I mentioned earlier, I believe Mr. Hughes has an update on the draft bike network plan that will be component of the 2045 comprehensive plan. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. If you go back to slide nine, slide nine, medium household income, I'm, and maybe you explain this, but what do you say about the trending downward for household incomes and in Rico versus trending upward in Richmond and trending upward in Commonwealth? Do you guys have any, you know, is, was there any undergirding information that goes along with um, our downward household income trend? No, it's what we found is that the stagnant wages that have been occurring since 2000. Um, along with the recession that we had in 2007 um, are two of the reasons behind this trend. And you're right, Richmond and the state of Virginia, the Commonwealth have seen a slight increase and we haven't had the opportunity yet to look at the actual 2020 data because when we put this together, all we had available to us is 2019. So there could be a change, but we have not yet to see that data. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Those were adjusted for inflation, you said? The, yes, the previous numbers were. And then on slide eight, the percentage of single family housing hasn't changed, just the numbers have actually gone up. So it continues to be about 65 35 split. Correct. And on slide seven, Enrico continues to outpace population growth, if I'm reading that correctly. Nash in Virginia and in the region. Thank you, ma'am. How, housing unit. Um, Dan's question just kind of, we don't control that person. I mean, it just kind of trends that way. It's, on, it's what gets filed, yeah. and then that's what is represented. You know, there's, there's nobody looking, you know, there's no one looking saying, hey, multifamily is jumping up to close to 40 or anything like that. It just so happens that it trends over the past 20 years that it looks 35, 65 in essence, right? Based upon what people are filing. Coming in with plans for it. Exactly. I was actually surprised by it. Yeah. Like I, 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 I did. I thought that it would see that dip a little bit. I thought, thought I was surprised by that. That's why I asked. I was kind of surprised that multifamily is not higher. Uh, I thought over twenty years. So. I did. I thought I wanted to get a definition. But the single family has changed, right? Single family. So you go what back is the to two thousand. You've now got is two over two a single family? Yes, I think believe that's now considered um, a single family in town. That's the so, sense of condominium, so it would uh, it would be it would be considered a single family. And then a town condominium is what single Those families are actually multifamily. Mm -hmm. They're counting them as single family, I think, in the census. Town towns town are counted so they're as single family. They're individually owned lots. So it's it's changed. So, so the only so the only multifamily is apartments. I believe so, yes, sir. Let yes, me check on that. Okay. Because it depends. Some 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 data will include multifamily as the two over twos, even though they're condominiums. You know, we have two different types of condos in the county. We've got the detached condominium, which in every appearance is a single family. And then you've got the attached condominium, which is your two over twos. Then you've got townhomes, which have a shared wall, but have a recorded lot with each townhome. And then you've got your, your typical apartments, which everybody logically thinks that's multifamily. And of course, that's one ownership renting out multiple units on a single parcel of land. And some, some data will contain those together, except for the townhomes because of the split lot, and some will split it up. So let me, so, let me so, 
So technically, it's all about the lot. So yes, if you if you're in a townhome community where the town the the board the homeowners association takes care of everything, the grass, the maintenance on the buildings, all of it. That's still a individual lot. That's, it could be depending upon how it's set up. If you've got an HOA that's fairly strong and fairly complicated, yes, you can have that, that true divided subdivision lot where the community takes care of everything. Condominiums, that more is in the, the Condominium Act that in the state code, and, and that regulates what has to be maintained in things because of the common ownership of the land underneath the property. So it I it gets kind of confusing. I I understand. So well, let me check on that number and I'll get that for you. What is the, the question? I think is what is the, the definition of single well, family? Uh, right. Home? We will uh, we'll that, get that and, and break it down for you because it, it is a little confusing. We'll work up something and send it to you. Madam Chair, uh, seeing no other questions for uh, Ms. Deem or Mr. Hughes, I think is coming forward. And this is a component of the uh, comp plan for the first time, right? We haven't had a, a bicycle plan in any prior comprehensive plan. So, Mr. Manager, um, thank you, Madam Chair. Members of the <laughs> so, uh, this, I'm, gonna, I'm here to talk about our draft uh, bike plan, which, as the manager mentioned, is, is a brand new component of the comprehensive plan to, uh, to add uh, to this next update. Um, here's just a, whoops, here's a quick graphic. Um, I think a lot of all of you have seen just the network. Uh, it covers countywide. There's a variety of uh, bike facilities that are that have been identified in the draft bike plan. Um, so why why are we doing it? Um, there's a lot of uh, benefits really associated with uh, with just biking in general, um, and trying to make sure that we we have. Uh, but we are considering some other modes. Um, you know, biking is is a uh, it's an active form of transportation. So it's it's one it's a form of <laughs> Keeps our, our residents uh, active. It's something that they that they're asking for. Um, it's also a primary mode of transportation for a number of people. Um, you know, you, you do have uh, you know, uh, vehicles can be expensive to own. There there are a number of people around the county that uh, that use this as a, a primary mode of transportation, and um, you know, just expand some of our multimodal offerings by by having a robust uh, bike network. I'll, I'll kind of highlight just some of the, the graphic, the infographic that, that is uh, included on the slide. And um, there, these are, this is just a national survey of the, of, uh, the different types of bikers. So uh, the far left, there's a strong and fearless and enthused and confident. That's 7% and 5% or about 12% of cyclists. Uh, these are people that you may see, you know, actually riding out on like roads like Staples Mill, or they're not afraid to ride on the two lane roads in, in rural Toronto. Uh, but the bulk majority of the folks who, uh, you know, who are who ride bikes kind of fall into the category of interested, but concerned or no way, no how. So uh, one really one thing that we're trying to do with the bike plan is, is uh, incorporating some infrastructure that cater really to the masses. So there are a number of people uh, who would be comfortable to ride on a shared use trail or a bike or a dedicated bike lane, um, you know, where, where, the, where there is a facility possible. Um, some of the other benefits of, of having a bike plan. So this, this graphic here shows a metric that the state uh, health department put together called uh, health opportunity index. I'm not going to get into it, but, but really it just, uh, these are areas where there were, you know, through a variety of factors, there could be opportunities to improve health uh, opportunities. So, um, you know, the way we kind of look at this, this factor with the bike plan is, you know, active transportation could play a part in providing a, uh, you know, healthier, uh, Healthier options. So having having facilities to bike, uh, for example, could help people get to and from grocery stores and uh, or just be a recreational opportunity. Uh, another good uh, benefit of having a bike plan really would be uh, the uh, equity. So uh, the factor that we're primarily focused on. There's a variety of factors that go into this graphic as well, but um, you know there are a number of areas in the county that have been identified, and the factor that we've Primary looked at, and this would be very valid for transit as well as is vehicle ownership. So homes that have single vehicle uh, for the family, or they don't have a, uh, a vehicle uh, available to them. So, so there are a number of areas in the county where improving our bike network can help address some of these, uh, and, and uh, as well. Um, and then, kind of looking forward, uh, really just the future of transportation. And uh, what I'm going to highlight here is e-bikes. So this is something that really took off in 2020. 
Um, you know, a lot of things took off with the pandemic with uh, virtual meetings, people working from home. A lot more people were out walking, a lot more people looking for uh, activities. And uh, one of the one of the byproducts really that took off during the 2020 and, and we've seen this trend grow forward has been the uh, the e-bike. Um, and if you go to some other major metropolitan areas that have very you know vibrant bike networks, you'll, you will see the e-bike. And, and really what it is, is um, it's a little different than a scooter, um, you know, a motorized scooter. This is something that somebody would actually, you know, they own. It's a motorized assist. So it can help uh, people of all different ages and abilities bike further distances over different types of terrain. Um, you know, a lot of people are talking about electric vehicles. Um, these outsold electric vehicles by you know, four times. So I think last year about 125,000 electric vehicles were sold. A half of, a half a million e-bikes were sold. So as uh, as these are becoming more and more readily available, more companies are producing them. The prices are coming down on this. Uh, we're seeing a lot more people uh, using this. And um, like I said, uh, if you're out on the Capitol Trail, you may even be passed by one of these because these things can go uh, go pretty fast. So, um, so. Yeah, that was, I have a question on that. That looks like Florida. I don't think that's around here, right? This one? Oh, that no, picture was. <laughs> um, they're also coming tri as tricycles, basically, with a big basket. And people, you know, go to the grocery store and short trips short distances, but um, I, I kind of worry about it because when you said it's out on the road, I mean, if they're on a road, if they go more than a certain miles per hour, don't you need like a special license or something? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, we've, as you know, we've had accidents mm -hmm. with cyclists. So I'm just thinking in terms of, I've seen those two kids hanging on the back and thinking they're going to fall off, <laughs> but anyway. <clears throat> but um, they do come with the tricycle variety, but it can go, I think it's up to what, 30 miles per hour? Go, 40 yeah, miles different. per hour. Um, can they go that? Some, yeah, I don't, I don't think they hit 30. Okay. Uh, Mr. Nelson, you recall, I mean, you and I went on. Yeah, it was like 20, 25, maybe 25. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's different levels of, of e-bike assist, and, and I think these are they're all regulated a little bit differently. So I think there are some that can go faster, but I think the, the types that that are typically regulated and or trails are limited to, I think class two, which I think is the twenty to twenty-five mile an hour. Because we have kids now that have um, what are they? You stand up. What are they called? Um, it's like what? The scooters or scooters? Yeah. yeah, that are zipping up and down the road and. You know, who, who has to have a driver's permit for this? I guess that's part of what I'm doing. So the, there's no permit requirement for an e-bike. And uh, that may change going forward. I know there are conflicts in some localities when you get sh on these shared use paths between bike cyclists and the e-bikes. But we just don't, I haven't seen a proliferation in the county. No, I haven't yet. either, but I'm anticipating something like that. We are promoting it by putting the big stripes down the roads and putting, you know, spray painting the bicycle symbols and that sort of thing. So we need to anticipate something like that. I kind of worry about that. That two kids on the back, as I said, <laughs> they're just holding on. You know, somebody's going to hit a bump and everything goes. But the tricycles are a little bit more sturdy, but they're intended for one person to ride in. Put the groceries, as I said, in bags. They're very large tricycles, too. It's not like a little tricycle. But, um, okay, well, I would anticipate. I'm, I'm also thinking about safety. That's all I'm thinking. Okay. Yeah, yeah quick comment. Uh, but it's more like a comment, but it may, yeah, it's more like a comment. I think now, as we talk about um, bicycling, um, I don't know how much effort time you guys have put into um, the needs of different communities as it relates to cycling. Um, I, I definitely know as we go forward and we start talking about this, I know a lot of times we do put in people riding bicycles to work. I, I know in Verona, that's not happen, happening. So if people on bicycles in Verona, they're riding it for leisure, you know, exercise, recreation, um, you know, maybe more so Westboro Village um, or or very tight urban communities. Um, but I think we just need to call it what it is. I mean, it is right now still about 
recreation, um, et cetera. It's not at this point in Henrico County, we're not doing this for people who are riding bikes to work per se. It may be a small and have, have you guys done any research or anything? You did so what what is it what, what did your research tell you about cycling? Cycling use. Oh and it's, uh, yeah, in general it's up. I mean the the, the highest Days and usage and places where we're seeing the highest usage are recreational reasons. Yeah, yeah, well, um, but but um, you know, if you kind of look, if you if you look at the tr the crash data and some of the data sources that we have, there are people who ride bikes at nighttime and, and and other times, and these are the folks that are riding their bikes to and from work. So we do have a number of people along a number of roads. I mean, we have roads like Woodman Road, Staples Mill Road. Broad Street. Um, yeah, west of it. Yeah, so that, I guess that's my point. You know. Williamsburg Road as well. So yeah, there's some roads where we do have some of it, but not as much. But <laughs> I got this information just a few years ago. This was pre-COVID. I know during COVID, the bicycles went up. They couldn't keep them in stock. Everybody wanted them. That was about one of the few forms of recreation, as you mentioned. But prior to that, the number one use of bicycles was from people who had DUIs. That was what they told me at the different bicycle shops um, and that they use that transportation to get to work, just as you said, because they were not allowed to drive a car. I mean, in Air County. So I'm hoping that's changed because with COVID, it did bring so much of the bicycling, you know, for sport or for fun to the fore. So, but I, I just want to point that out. The last survey I did was pre-COVID, probably about 2018. About bicycle use, right? I didn't want to. To, to your to your point, I, I think in the West it's still mainly recreation, mm -hmm. hence why the pump track is so successful, hence why the 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 lanes are so successful. But if you sit outside of Innsbruck, probably not right now in eighteen degree weather, <laughs> but in the springtime and summer, you would it, you would be surprised. How many people are coming down Church Road or off of Broad or um, off of Springfield riding their bikes into work at, in, in Innsbruck? Believe it or not, I, I I didn't believe it. I went and checked. So there is it the mass majority or a huge volume? Heck, no. If that was the case, we wouldn't have traffic issues on Broad Street. But. It, it is you, you, there are a decent amount of people that are using it as a mode of transportation. To get to work. We were prepared as public for this as more people are using bikes because there is a, with uh, some drivers this um, dual personality. Sometimes they don't quite watch the people who are biking and. Uh, we need to make sure that as this becoming more popular, that we put things in place for safety. I think that's that's primary, and I'm sure that we'll do that. Uh, and that will forget I had an incident on the Burnham Avenue. Uh, probably was ahead of his time. I should have done it. Um, I had um, something like a bike. We call it something else. And I saw this piece of wood in the road and I was driving toward the edge. I did something I should have done. I hit the brakes, flipped over the burn them. Um, and so obviously I was traumatized. So I got out of the road there. But uh, what I was uh, wondering about is nobody trying to help me out at all. And I said, my gosh, what is happening out here? Then I did a neighbor eventually came by, heard me and that bike home. And I never did ride that bike again. But what I noticed in all of that is that some people didn't feel that other people should be on the highway. So safety is very important. I think that's what we're trying to have a designated bike network so that it is safer. Um, hmm. So. So as you go through, I'm going to ask you to. If you can just uh, uh, speed up this portion of presentation because we are going to run up against uh, time. You've got uh, solar coming up. Okay. 
Um, so yeah, I'll just note the, uh, we put this together with a lot of in-house staff uh, to put the draft plan together uh, over the course of a number of meetings. And there are a number of things in the bike plan. I'll, I'll kind of quickly thumb through it. I'm familiar with the bike lanes. Uh, this is one out um, at Park Terrace. Uh, this is one on Twin Hickory Drive. A buffered bike lane provides a little bit extra spacing for the bike uh, between the road. Uh, here's a cycle track. This is this isn't something we have in Henrico currently right now, but um, you know this is this may be a viable tool. Um, you know, with public engagement, depending on the uh, characteristics of the corridor to implement. These are very very popular nationwide. Uh, we're going to actually probably this spring go to Raleigh to look at a couple. Uh, so these are uh, enhanced routes. So these are routes that that currently are used that are a little bit off the road network um, that you know, you know could be improved upon. Um, the one um, on the right is in uh, it's off of Lake uh, Lakeside, uh, where you see the uh, some goat paths where people are are actively using. So these are opportunities for us to improve the accommodations and the use. Uh, paved shoulder. So this is one that we may mostly see out in um, eastern rural Verina, which would. Uh, you know, provide a better facility for both the car and provide some safety benefits uh, for the car to prevent some runoff road incidents, um, as well as provide a dedicated space for cyclists to be able to use. Because um, the traffic rooms are a lot. Um, this is the shared use path. So this is this is something that we would look to install on any new new roads that we build. Um, areas, um, you know, this is this is probably the preferred. Uh, you know, if we if funding was unlimited, put these in um, and right of way was unlimited uh, because this this is this serves all modes. It's off traffic, uh, separated and, and generally wide. Um, you know, the fall on trail will be a shared use trail. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about the signed bike routes. So this is something that we may be able to rapidly deploy for very low cost. Um, you know, running these through low volume, 25 mile an hour streets and uh, subdivisions that help route you and connect you to other bike networks. Um, so I'll just show you this. So this is a, a mock-up. So this isn't necessarily what what we would have to do, but for you know, we'll probably be talking with you about input on what that bike route signage could look like. And uh, this is just an example. Um, you know, there may be opportunities to name some of the routes, and uh, you know, when we come up with some of the numbers to help route people through neighborhoods um, as well. Um, so this there's a number of. Uh, Corridors that are identified in our bike plan is to be studied. Whether you know, it's just no simple, easy solution, but it's an area that some kind of accommodation is needed. Uh, there might be a lot of stakeholder involvement. Um, that be I mean, or multiple options could could potentially be a solution. So we have identified a number of corridors to be studied. Uh, we actually currently have about 15 studies. Uh, some have been funded by VDOT. Some have been funded by the county that are currently underway uh, throughout the county, uh, looking at roadway reconfigurations. As well, so uh, you may be, uh, you know, there may be some opportunities to coordinate with you and uh, and the public uh, in the near future on some of these routes. Question, uh, Mr. Manager. So this is um, we are supporting this with dollars in your proposed budget. Yes, the studies and a and a more significant and a more significant pace that we that we've done in the past. You are going to see more and more of this, absolutely. And you've also got, and I'm sorry, um, CBTA local money that we haven't even talked about. So a couple of things for your input. So um, I know this draft, this, the bike plan is in draft form. We haven't taken it out to the public. It has not been adopted. Uh, the one uh, thing I wanted to I just pass to you for consideration is uh, public works. You know, as we as we work through our repaving schedule, as our traffic engineering section is out and striking roads, we would like to begin implementation on uh, the bike, the draft bike plan, uh, take advantage of some of the opportunity costs. So we are a couple of years away from the comprehensive plan um, being adopted, but there are we're constantly resurfacing roads every year. Church Road is a great example of a road that we had on our resurfacing plan, and we were able to save a lot of money. Um, there, are, there are a number of other roads that uh, are currently that are very similar, um, and it's a very cost effective way to add and improve our bike network. So um, that's one item I would like to add, uh, you know, for your consideration is, is we would like to move forward with starting to implement some of the items in the draft bike plan. And then the other item is um, we would like to move forward with public engagement as well uh, through uh, a hybrid approach. So we've seen some success with a lot of our uh, transportation projects uh, doing the hybrid approach where we have video online survey for public involvement. As well as, uh, you know, 
finding places like libraries and churches to uh, to do community engagement. So with that, my presentation's done. Well done. Question to uh, Libby Mill Blank Share Plan. What's the timeline on that? You know, the piece between Bethlehem and uh, Broad. Uh, that is road yeah. dieting and road dieting, doing yeah. some stuff there. What's the timeline on that? I just get questions about that a lot. I have to get back to the specific. I think it's within a couple of the next couple of years though. That that's currently it's currently in the design phase. Very minimal right of ways needed. So that that's yeah. one. That, uh, you know, once we have design plans, I think we'll be able to be fairly good with it. Is that handsome guy in that picture next to the red jacket guy? Yeah. <laughs> 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 okay, I could get into a lot of stuff right now. But we're going to take a five minute break and get our lunch and then get into the solar projects. Okay. All right, everyone, please let's see if we can catch up. We are back. If we continue uh, now, uh, solar projects in the planning park and Blankenship. Mr. Blankenship, I, I was hoping you'll make an announcement that chickens are now legal in Henrico. Chickens are now legal in Henrico. We have three applications on the board of zoning appeals agenda for next Thursday. Good. So Thank we will you. have our first three. Uh, experiences and we will all begin to learn together. Thank you very much. <laughs> now we have solar projects. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I've been asked to discuss, uh, of course, a new. Where goes uh, those apps? One is in Verona, one is in Tuckahoe, and one is in Fiji. They spray it out. <laughs> and you know, as we get into this, there's a the reason that this areas coming forward as you are getting more and more requests you're seeing more solar on our facilities quite frankly there's a lot of synergy in this area and we're going to need um, some sort of alignment on policies going forward and so the premise here is that solar is good for building solar is good for uh, the environment but solar is also good uh, in all magisterial districts, as opposed to focusing on just, you know, one magisterial district because of the lay of the land. And so, uh, Ben's going to go through and show you a process where uh, the board would become more involved uh, in approving some of these solar projects going forward. So, Ben? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Uh, so, I have been asked to uh, discuss some new state legislation that is changing how uh, we review approved solar projects. And part of that comes out of the Virginia Clean Air Act passed by the General Assembly last year, which puts a, a great deal of pressure on Dominion Energy to provide renewable energy facilities. And as a result, all across the Commonwealth, Dominion is working with developers to identify sites that are suitable for solar energy projects. So we're going to be talking mostly about solar energy as the principal use of the property. I do want to just put out on the table that that is not the only uh, type of solar project we are seeing. Uh, so the principal use could be a greenfield site, uh, could be a former gravel pit, or even a closed landfill, any place where you have a large expanse of land. Uh, but we are also seeing solar projects accessory to other uses. Uh, if you drive down Hungary Road, you see a couple of houses with solar panels in front of them. Um, Hugh Joyce has set those up, and those serve primarily that house. So that's not really a solar project that's accessory to the house. We're also putting solar panels on some of our own schools, uh, as I'm sure you're aware. So uh, those are other installations of solar, solar panels that are not really solar farms, not what we're talking about here this morning. We're really talking about the larger projects where it's the principal use of the properties. And the county has already approved two of these, and one has been constructed. Uh, Brielle Farm Solar uh, between Meadow Road and Interstate 64 and Interstate 295. This was approved by the Board of Supervisors in 2017 by the Board of Zoning Appeals that year. And again, they, they had to renew their permit in 2019. Uh, and that is now uh, on the ground and, and operating. It was also a project between Brian and Stratford, it's called Turner Solar, which was approved at about the same time. The, uh, Substantially in court was approved by this board in 2017. 
again, the BZA then followed up with use permits in 2017 and 2019, but that uh, use permit has expired and they have not renewed. So that one, at this time is not being constructed. Um, the manager mentioned that uh, solar has its pros and cons like every other use. Uh, it can be a placeholder for a future use. Real Farm is a good example of that. It's a prime economic development site, but there are some issues that have to be overcome before it can be developed. And putting solar panels with approximately a 20, 25 year lifespan on them is a way to make good use of that property while we're waiting for those other opportunities to come around. Uh, solar farms do place a very small burden on county services. They create very little traffic or noise once the construction is completed. And the EDA uh, is, uh, it is helpful to the EDA to be able to sell to uh, prospects that we are a location that provides green energy. There are many industries these days that want green energy as part of the package that they're being presented with. Uh, but on the other hand, the solar energy, the solar panels themselves are usually not the highest and best use of the land. Uh, and they generate very limited revenue to the county. Uh, and the process of constructing a solar farm can create a great deal of noise and traffic. Uh, and they can be unsightly if they're not screened. If you drive through other parts of the state, you'll see solar installations that come right down through the road with no landscaping or screening. And of course, we wouldn't allow that in Henrico County. We would require a setback, landscaping, screening, and buffering. But they can be unsightly if they're not, not being careful to be used. Uh, the new state law includes a provision for siting agreement, which would take the place of the old substantially in the court. Um, so the, rather than beginning the process by bringing to you a substantially in the court finding, the applicant is required now to provide the county with written notice of their proposal and to request a meeting with county staff and then they negotiate a siting agreement. And the agreement has to be approved by the board after a public hearing. Um, and even with the siting agreement, the applicant still must meet all uh, local ordinances and must obtain all other approvals. But the siting agreement takes the place of the SIA finding. So if you make an agreement on a specific site, your agreement includes a finding that that site is an appropriate location for a solar farm. Uh, so this is a just a brief overview of the old process prior to the change in state law and the change in your zoning ordinance. Uh, compared to the process that we have in place right now. So instead of starting with the SIA, they start with the siting agreement. We would recommend that that go to the Planning Commission for review, the same as an SIA does. It would have to go to you, the board, uh, for public hearing and for approval. And then once the siting agreement is approved, the applicant can go direct to detailed plans, uh, plan of development, uh, which would be subject to the new regulations that were written into the zoning but we have taken, as I mentioned, we have taken that third public hearing before the Board of Zoning Appeals out of it. <coughs> uh, so the siting agreement, as I was saying, can include mitigation of impacts. Uh, these are just a few examples of the kinds of impacts that we would expect uh, to be mitigated. And that the zoning ordinance does include some specific requirements on some of these issues for countywide, uh, you know, things that we can anticipate countywide would be problems. But each site has its own particular local issues and concerns. And so the siting agreement gives you the opportunity to negotiate solutions case by case on those specific uh, issues. And also the state code specifically provides that the financial contribution, that the siting agreement may include a financial contribution uh, for capital projects in the CIP or for capital projects that are in your current budget, or it specifically mentions deployment of broadband. So there are two uh, issues that we would like your uh, feedback on, if you will, um, recommendations that we would like to uh, know that have your support. Uh, for one, staff has reviewed some siting agreements that are in effect in other localities. And we have also calculated the amount of revenue that could have been expected from a solar farm if they were not partially exempt from the machinery and tools tax. And finally, we have considered the revenue sharing that is authorized by the state tax code. And based on these three sources, staff recommends that there be an upfront payment for the siting agreement that would be based on specific factors for each site. And that in addition, every solar farm should be expected to contribute uh, $1,600 per megawatt annually in lieu of the M&T tax. So a 20 megawatt site 
such as uh, either Brielle and, and Turner Solar, those were both 20 megawatts. This would be $32,000 in the first year, and then would be indexed uh, to increase with inflation. And that would just help replace some of the revenue that is lost because these facilities are exempt from M&T tax. Uh, and we would, we would also suggest that case by case, that tax money be earmarked to a specific project just to, to help make that connection for the public that in, in lieu of approving this, there is a specific tangible benefit going to the community. Uh, the other thing that we would like to, to ask you, ask your uh, input on uh, your agreement with, is as I mentioned, the uh, conditional use permit before the zoning appeals was cut out of the process. And under the old process with the SIA, we felt that there was no need for adding a provisional use permit for your review or for the Planning Commission's review, because we felt like the SIA review gave us that same uh, comfort level with approving a solar farm. Uh, we are not as certain about how the siting agreement is going to work just because it's a new process. We, we don't know exactly what parameters are going to be placed on that, exactly how it's going to flow. And so you may want to return to requiring not a conditional use permit, but a provisional use permit, which could be uh, processed concurrently with the siting agreement. So if you were to add the provisional use permit, it would not increase the number of public hearings. It would not increase the timeline of the project. It wouldn't have any effect like that. It would just give the county an additional layer of comfort that you have more of an opportunity to place conditions on an approval if you do choose to approve the site. And so this is what it would look like with that recommendation. Uh, and it's again, comparing it to the way it used to be under the old code. So rather than submitting an SIA, the, the applicant would now submit a siting agreement and a PUP application concurrently with it. Uh, those would go to the planning commission for review and, and recommendation. Then they would come to you. There has to be a public hearing on both of those. Uh, and once the board has approved the siting agreement and a provisional use permit, then the applicant would go to their detail plans or PWD plans, which would be reviewed and approved and administered. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer your questions. Oh, there was also, uh, I guess, James Beasley is back on after the connection issues. Yes, he is. Alternative opportunity to receive input from the student. Part of the reason it um, is James on is he, uh, can you unmute him? So um, I just wanted to number one, thank you, James, for being on, but also the number of conversations that I think Mr. Brandon, you had with Mr. Beasley about some potential for solar uh, in the pre chop district, and we do have some potential. Uh, in all five districts um, within uh, within reason, but I don't know if you want to speak to uh, any of those conversations, James. So, good Sorry. afternoon, James. Question, Mr. Brand, Mr. Brandon wants solar in the region. We we have some projects we can say you with. <laughs> um, so, uh, James, before you start for for the benefit. Of of my my fine fellow supervisor from Eastern Henrico, we have a hundred and ten acres. Is that right, James? One hundred and ten. Isn't that what we're looking at? I I believe so. Yes, sir. Approximately a hundred and ten acres of unusable land in the three chop district. Uh, the Springfield landfill was closed about nine years ago, and. Uh, we are currently using that area for um, recycling of, of brush or mulch that's free to the to the to the citizens. Where we we are catching leachate gases and creating energy that's being sold sold to Dominion Energy, um, uh, and we have unusable land. I went to Tom Farrell, I guess six years ago, and we sat down and looked at the feasibility. The technology just wasn't there. And um, James, myself, and Mr. Blue had started the conversation again. So I don't know if James is going to give me unbelievably great, but if we can pull this off on the landfill, then we would absolutely have a 100% renewable land for pulling off the leachate, recycling, and, and creating solar energy. So you're up, James. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members of the Board of Supervisors. 
Uh, James Beasley, I'm a regional uh, policy director uh, for Dominion Energy and uh, support the counties um, on external affairs uh, opportunities and then just uh, making sure we're just a, a, a conduit from the county and your citizens into Dominion Energy. So I'm happy to be here this morning or this afternoon to speak. Um, it, just two qu uh, clarifications really on uh, where we talk about solar, where we talk about uh, earlier on the presentation, it was really dealing with large scale solar facilities, large scale solars, solar facilities, or anything greater than five megawatts. And and what we and I'm going to be using energy speak and then breaking that down. A megawatt equals uh, roughly about 250 homes of energy use. So anything greater than uh, five megawatts is, is a, a larger scale solar facility. Anything below five megawatts is a small scale solar facility. So what uh, what you were talking about, Supervisor Brandon, is, is more on a small scale solar um, opportunity, which could be anything below five, three, or even less than a megawatt of, of uh, solar. And so we are uh, looking at small scale solar opportunities, not only in Horico and partnerships, um, but we're also looking across our service territory. In addition to small scale solar, uh, we have large scale solar um, that we are really focusing in across our our footprint. You can really uh, really focusing right now in Southern Virginia. We have a lot of uh, projects um, that we are self developing ourselves under the Dominion Energy banner name, and then also we are uh, putting out RFPs and, and working with uh, some solar developers and procuring any solar development that have uh, been permitted or going forward on that. And then lastly, we're doing battery storage. And so at some point, um, I will be back and my colleagues will be back uh, to talk to you. There may be some potential opportunities with battery storage. As it relates to the Springfield area of the three shop, Supervisor Brandon, I will tell you that we have had some initial conversations and we will continue those conversations and hopefully we'll be able to uh, come back to you and your fellow board members here um, in the near future to kind of talk about that, but we're just now kicking off early conversations. So I don't have any much more than that to share as of right now. Well, I think we can get it done, James. Uh, I think it, it, it is a, a, a big positive, whether it's through third party or, or not. Uh, I think it is a big positive for both uh, the county as a whole and uh, Dominion Energy as in, in, a, in being in a partnership. And, and and we believe, uh, thank you, sir. And we believe uh, working with you and collaborating with Horico County is, is a is a great opportunity. Thank you very much for being thank there, you, Madam Chair. Um, and I particularly like what you're proposing down here to require the provisional use permit. I, I think that's a good way. Wouldn't that be a good way to get like landscaping around it or things like that? Are those the type of things you would probably have recommendations? Yes, ma'am. That, that can be negotiated in the siting agreement, but with the provisional use permit, we would have the additional. That's why I'm right there. Any other comments? Got a couple of questions on the financial contribution pieces. You guys, I'm sure you researched that across the board. Where, where did we where did we come up with those? Any background on how we came up with those figures? So the three that we have reviewed. Uh, one is in Surrey County, and that's a 180 megawatt facility, so it's nine times as big as the ones that we've approved so far. One was in King and Queen County, which was 150 megawatts, so not quite as big, but still quite quite a lot larger than ours. And one was in Sussex County, and that's a 75 megawatt. So these are all larger projects than, than what we have seen so far in Henrico County. But the Surrey County project, with their agreement totaled 8.82 million over 35 years. And basically breaks down to 1400 per megawatt per year, uh, which is the number that is specified in the state code provision for revenue sharing. Uh, the King and Queen County uh, was 3.475 million over 40 years for capital improvements, plus a $4 million payment over the first three years, specifically for broadband. So almost four spread out over 40 years and four over just the first three years. And that averages out uh, again, dividing by those that is a huge project averages out to 1,246 per megawatt per year. So a little lower than the 1400 number that is in the state code or the 1600 number that we came up with. Uh, Sussex County similarly uh, worked out to a, approximately four and a half million dollars 
over a 45 year span, uh, which averages out to 1,316. So the, the siting agreements we were able to find all seem to be clustered around that same amount. Uh, but our projects being smaller overall, we felt like would support a slightly larger per megawatt contribution because the, the, you know, the absolute dollar figures would not be anywhere near as large. Um, and again, comparing it to the revenue share that is provided for specifically in state code, which is 1400, uh, we felt that 1600 would be a bargaining position to begin with, at least, uh, that would be supportable. You know, we would expect a developer to be able to sustain this. Well, minimum four, right? So it's like if you have one megawatt, there's no, it's just per megawatt. Yes. It's minimum level, that's and it a, goes up from there. It, as far as the, the recommendation that we've come up with. Thank you, Mr. Manager. I'm assuming you've been made comfortable with the trade off of the fee versus the tax. Yes, right. sir. It's a conversation that we had, and the reality is, you know, the other three localities uh, really are in areas of the state that, that don't really provide any kind of services. Or not the uh, significant services that we do. So, and the calculation when Ben did it for uh, Briel actually put it in play for me. It was thirty two thousand dollars. Yes. Sir. So, right now, I mean, these solar farms come in. They're tying up land. Twenty years. They're not providing any revenue benefit to the town. They should. And so, um, this proposal. Uh, clarifies that and then also I mean what I liked about what Ben suggested was that it brings it back to you. So <clears throat> uh, because again they, they when they first came in they weren't taxed, right? The state law excluded them from the uh, machinery was it the machinery tools, yes sir. We do tax the real estate but not the machinery tools. Right. So the theory is the more what megawatts the bigger amount of land they're using, therefore, the cost and there's and you guys have evaluated this up ways and sideways. There's no way someone could take advantage of using I don't know, more land and, and just collecting less megawatts. Therefore, you know what I'm saying? You know, yeah. you know, you know what I'm saying? Paying less of the megawatt for using large some provision in there that prohibits large amount of land, small amount of megawatt, megawatt use, and therefore low fees. So this what we're recommending is a guideline. From which we would negotiate specific agreements. So each agreement could have its own. You know, there, there could be a, a location where there's something that none of us have anticipated. Absolutely. And when we negotiated with that particular developer, you know, yeah, we would be that's where your first point comes in. Of course, yes. based on site specific factors. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Good. And I, I I agree with what's up on the screen right there with adding the the original use to it. Part of shift. Yep. It used to be. Uh, Landfill on Tuxedo Boulevard. Uh, that's over near 64 in the eastern part of the county. And uh, I remember when I used to take trash over there and all of that. And so that profit 20 years ago kind of closed down. And uh, what I'm wondering about though is that some of those places that uh, lie dormant for X number of years. And I've seen in some localities they build other things on top of them. So might this be then, because uh, I think you can get gas from that as we get from the other one. Yes, sir. So might something like this be uh, advantageous uh, in the future, uh, similar to what we've done before, taking a look at that? Because I don't know how many people remember that it used to be a landfill. You know, uh Mr. Thornton, I'm actually hearing from Steve Yab, who is saying uh, if we can absolutely look at it. The landfill is about 40 acres. It's 40 acres. I yes, sir. And I know James is still on. I mean, that's something we need to really look at, you know, to see what we have that we used to use for something else. And, uh, and, and my um, issue for bringing it up is I don't feel too comfortable. A person going in and building another subdivision in there, particularly since that was a landfill years before. So maybe that's one efficacious use we can find for this if the place and location is right. I'm just not sure. The potential is certainly there subject to the engineer. I think it's a great thing to do with like all former landfills because we have had construction on 
<laughs> excuse me, former landfills. And I lived in an apartment house that was built on a former landfill. We had rats everywhere. So, because it was still breaking down. Yeah. <laughs> under it definitely the, require individual stuff. Yeah. No, but I, I like that idea. Of course, uh, excellent. Okay, are there any other questions? Yeah, one last one, Mr. Disadvantage. I think this is a good thing for us as locality to watch out for things like that so that if, the, if, a, if a, some group wanted to do something like that, that would be deleterious to those persons who want to live in that place. For us to really take a look at the offerings that people bring us to make sure it, that it's the best thing for future residents and for the locality. Absolutely. We'll add that to the list as far as analyzing uh, in addition to Springfield. Okay, any other questions? Members of the Thank you very much. Thank you. We've completed the um, information about the comprehensive plan update.